Asiera emango diogu estabaidari, estabaidan egongo dia Maiken Van Valt, Alain Gañón, Jorge Cajiau, eta Sergius Bober, donatela eh, azken orduko bat izan du eta deskonektatu behar euki du, alba du berriz konektatuko da debatera, baina, bueno, baditugu eh, pertsonak eta estabaidagai. Eduardo Ruiz Beitezen eskutan, usten zaitxustet, eta estabaida oparoa. Perhaps I can begin yes, please. With, the, with the first provocation, I would, I would call it this way, and then, of course, we will see what, what, what happens. Um, yeah, I think it's a very, of course, a very relevant, but also, as you said, a very broad question, how shall we determine that actually a conflict of sovereignty exists? And my initial answer, uh, but I just want to flesh it out now and then see how, how panel reacts to this. I think that ultimately this is a political question. And um, here again in my presentation, I was focusing mostly on the on the Scottish example. And I think that um, well, the, the political the, the political argument and the political dimension needs to be there. And if we look at the, the most recent history of, of, of of the United Kingdom and what happened just before the, the, the Scottish referendum, of course, there were certain polish, political dynamics inside Scotland that relatively clearly showed that there is a certain very extensive sector of population that would like to seriously consider the possibility of Scottish um, independence. So I would say that certain critical mass is necessary. And of course, the, the, in the British context, what was important is that that was met with the willingness to acknowledge it by the, by the national level and proceed in a legal way, step by step towards the, the referendum and the answer that was given by, the, by, the, by those who were eligible, eligible to vote. So I think that this element of political reality or political pressure might be also important. Um, and then, as you said, in some in, in some examples, the, there is there is this lack of recognition that actually the territorial conflict of sovereignty exists. And here, and I will stop. I will stop with this first interve intervention uh, now. Here, I think that the civic political slash civic way is very very important. So to try, of course, the element of fatigue can also happen during this process, but I think that the political slash civic way of sort of pressing the argument that actually we have reached in a given region, in a given, in a given small scale polity, we have smaller scale polity, we have reached a certain level where actually this question, whether we want to be, be independent or not, is very legitimate, should be pressed up to a point where the national level rec recognizes this, but as we know, of course, from the, from, for example, from the example of Catalonia, it's easier said than, than done. But I think that this level of, of civil activity and, and political level is very, very important here. So that's my initial opening remark. Mm -hmm. perhaps, to, perhaps to pursue, uh, there is, uh, at the moment, there is an acknowledgement on the part of Madrid that uh, there is obviously a problem with uh, regards to the, the state, uh, the region of Catalonia, the fact that there is a, an ongoing table, people, uh, or the official meeting, uh, minist ministerial level discussion. So there is an acknowledgement. Uh, but at the same time, the uh, implication is that Madrid doesn't want to change anything. Uh, they want, in fact, they are wasting everyone's time, so to speak, but there is an acknowledgement as long as there is no political implication or consequences to these gathering. Uh, so perhaps the, the alternative or the solution is to be found within Europe, obviously. This morning we heard Nicolas uh, Le, Levra, we spoke about the Copenhagen Declaration, and I think there is, a, there is something to be said about this declaration but also much more recently, uh, in 2012, there is a Ljubljana guideline that have been proposed. And the Ljubljana guideline is about, the, uh, about how do you accommodate or seek to accommodate uh, national minorities within countries. Now, obviously this idea of accommodation integration 
does not fit the exact bill because what is needed, what we need to add to the guidelines of, uh, of Ljubljana will be the empowerment of the minority nation. And at the moment, Europe is not willing to move in that direction. And, and that's unfortunate, but perhaps pressure that needs to come from different circles among which the association of region within the, the community of Europe ought to be mobilized perhaps around this potential arena. Bueno, yo decía solo un comentario, un comentario sobre la mm, caracterización precisamente de los conflictos de soberanía eh, que yo creo, yo creo encontramos sobre todo precisamente en los casos en los que hay una ausencia de reconocimiento de la otra parte como, como parte legítima para entrar, para entablar un diálogo y buscar juntos una eventual salida. Y creo que, creo que el, el, caso, el caso de Escocia lo muestra, lo muestra especialmente bien. El caso escocés, con el referéndum de 2014, yo no sé si me atrevería a decir que se trata de un conflicto territorial de soberanía. No al menos en el momento en el que surgió el problema, las demandas uh, escocesas. Quizás el problema se haya vuelto a día de hoy, en el 2020 y en los próximos años, con la especial, especial situación que ha traído el Brexit, o que va a traer el Brexit. Quizás ahora sí podamos tener un conflicto de soberanía en el Reino Unido entre el gobierno británico y el, el gobierno escocés, entre la mayoría británica y la mayoría política escocesa, pero de pronto, de pronto en el, la, la diferencia que uno constata entre lo sucedido en Escocia, con, en el Reino Unido con Escocia, y lo sucedido en España con, con Cataluña, es que todo se hizo relativamente con mucha naturalidad, eh, con bastante rapidez, con mucho civismo en el Reino Unido, reconociendo precisamente eh, la legitimidad de la, de, de la mayoría escocesa para llevar a cabo el proyecto que se proponía y sin duda, sin duda en esto creo que tiene, tiene una, una, una gran importancia el hecho de que el Reino Unido tenga una vieja tradición, una tradición histórica de reconocimiento de sus minorías nacionales o de sus naciones internas. ¿no? Eh, mientras que en el caso español esto es mucho más, eh, esto es mucho más difícil, es mucho más complejo. Podemos observar cómo en el caso español esa dificultad para reconocer a sus naciones internas, el País Vasco o, o Cataluña, y en el, en el caso catalán concretamente, ha llevado a un callejón sin salida eh, eh, en, el, en el caso de las demandas de, de, de autodeterminación o de secesión eh, hechas por la mayoría política catalana. Y yo creo que sí, en el, caso, en el caso catalán, en España, sí tenemos un auténtico conflicto de soberanía en la medida en que hay una, hay una falta de reconocimiento y, 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 y entramos, el problema entra en, una, en un callejón sin salida, en, en, en un terreno en el que no hay solución y lo único, lo único que se puede observar es una degradación de ese conflicto iniciado, ¿no? Sería lo único que quería comentar sobre, sobre esta, esta, esta observación que hacías. Perhaps if I can react, uh, since there was no other question. There is a question coming from Nicola McEwen. Uh, I think that needs to be addressed because Nicola is, is telling us that there is a, the issue of, the, well, how do we define sovereignty? I mean, obviously the, the UK uh, doesn't see it the same way at least London doesn't see it the same way in uh, Edinburgh. And uh, the same thing probably applies to Canada, I mean, the way that sovereignty is being viewed. So oftentimes uh, the federal, the central government in Canada will say, well, if sovereignty is simply about the management or the implementation of public policy, Quebec can have a lot of leeway. But if it's uh, about the being a political subject, perhaps it's not that uh, we should not encourage this. And this is what's happening really at the moment in, in Scotland, where the political subject appears to be only one. And, but when it, when it is about the management of public policy, then you could have several actors intervening. And, and uh, we see that uh, occurring uh, more and more in Canada now, although many people praise the 1998 uh, Supreme Court uh, reference Uh, it remains that it is the, the Supreme Court itself that uh, determine the nature of the uh, political arrangements 
and then they pass it on to politician to mobilize group potentially. But we know that since 1998, there has not been any constitutional, significant constitu constitutional changes. So it is in fact about the status quo. So the 1998 has led us to the status quo position for the last 20 years and no one wants to discuss the constitution. But they, they're willing to discuss public policy and who should do what, but not it's not the discussion about the demos. If I can add something, and it's also in relation to to what uh, Jorge has said before and to to what Nicola posted on on the chat. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting because indeed, well, Jorge has said that if I understood properly, I was listening to the to the Spanish version that we kind of have these two narratives. And in the, on the one hand, there is a Scottish uh, version of the referendum of conflict of sovereignty dilemma or referendum dilemma, which is fairly positive because it was legal. The, the, the national level, in that case, London, acknowledged that there is a willingness to within the, the, the Scottish population, Scottish electorate, to have this kind of a referendum. And then legally, as I said before, step by step, you know, all this procedure happened until the moment of vo voting and, and certain result. Um, and then the, the, the other story is the Catalan story where, as you, as you said, perhaps Spain and Catalonia has reached this callejón sin salida, like a coup de sac, and there's no sort of way out of, of this. But I wonder, and here it's very speculative what I will say, but I think it's relation to, 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 what, to what Nicola said, because the question would be to what degree we can assume that in the future, actually, and here I refer to Scotland, the same scenario will happen again, that London will be willing, when faced with certain electoral trends, elector election results, and so on, will be willing to accept that there should happen another referendum. And as you perhaps remember in the context of the, the, the past referendum, but this argument is actually still alive. And as far as I can remember, it was even used a couple of days ago by representatives of the, of the government in, in London. This should be a one in a generation decision. So Scotland should not be too optimistic when it comes to the another go at the, at the referendum. Um, and at the same time, as Nicola correctly correctly pointed, uh, there is this issue, which I just mentioned. Then there are conflicting versions of sovereignty. So with Brexit, as we can interpret it, I guess, as this ultimate way of sort of referencing to the classic conservative vision of sovereignty as opposed to the Scottish one, which, as I said before in my presentation, is more internationalist, open to the world, and pro-European, most importantly, if we if we if we mention, mention Brexit, Brexit. And then another factor, these are the political con cal calculations with, which I just mentioned. So actually, and here is this bit of futurology, um, but actually we might be heading towards a scenario where actually this callejón sin salida, the school de sac, blind end, will be reached also in, Sp in Scotland. Because the recent polls show that the, the, the support for independence is actually increasing. This is, of course, correlated with the with the way London performs vis-a-vis -vis the COVID-19 crisis, but also, of course, it's related to, to, to Brexit. So there is this growing pressure. We will see what, what the next election brings in, in Scotland, but it cannot be excluded that, again, a strong sector, very, very significant sector of population will be at least indirectly sort of saying that, you know, the, the, the another re referendum should actually take place. But this time around, London actually might not be listening. So we might actually have two, uh, two cul-de-sacs in, in Europe in a, in a very near future, which perhaps, again, makes it even more important, this whole endeavor in which we are all engaged now, that means the, the code of good practices. And I'm, I'm stopping here. If I may, um, uh, if I may, uh, I'm not sure if I if I'm um, uh, coming through, but um, yes. also in answer in in response to some of the things that have been said, plus uh, the one uh, question that was asked 
by the anonymous attendee on, on the screen. Um, I think uh, as, uh, as Donatella pointed out, part of the issue is how the, the, um, how the conflict is framed. And I'm thinking not at this point uh, so much in terms of how the institutions, uh, the state, the, the uh, sub-state polity, frames it, but also how the populations in both places uh, conceive and respond to the issues in the conflict. Um, and in the question that is, that is being posed, um, it says, you know, the, 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 the issue is who is the subject of self-determination um, uh, if, if it is only the entity that wishes or the population that wishes to uh, self-determine, then the rest of the population of the state is being ignored and is being denied its right. Um, I've spent a large part of my life uh, trying to, uh, to mediate uh -huh. and to resolve precisely these kinds of conflicts. And I think the, the issue is that um, it is not helpful to conceive of these conflicts in absolute terms, in black and white terms. And sometimes even the concept of sovereignty, um, and I'm not suggesting this is being said by the participants here, quite the contrary, but outside of this, uh, of this more sophisticated discussion, the concept of sovereignty is seen very much as something um, that is black and white, something that um, a people owns, um, uh, an individual in a population often has a kind of map fixation where the notion that part of its territory, the territory that it conceives that it owns, is going to be taken away um, by this group um, is, is a very curious issue because it, it's, it, it, um, um, it frames questions of choice of democracy, of constitutionalism, in purely territorial terms, as if um, the issue is the ownership of the territory as opposed to um, uh, deriving from the, um, the desires or the, the, the rights or the uh, choices of people who happen to live on a particular territory. In other words, the territory kind of determines what the rights are of the people when we talk about territorial sovereignty, as opposed to that we're really talking about the people and it ha so happens that they uh, manage, that they live on uh, and, and uh, therefore require a certain territory to fulfill their social and economic and political needs. Um, and so uh, in the first place, I think it is important to address this territorial fixation as if, um, for example, in the case of Spain, there are many Spanish people uh, outside of Catalonia, but also within Catalonia, that really consider that if uh, the Catalans were to um, exercise their right to self-determination and, and ultimately separate, that they would lose a piece of their territory as if it belongs to the person in Madrid, the person in uh, Valencia, the person in some other part of Spain. In other words, something is being taken away from them. Um, so I think that's, that's an issue that, that, that needs from a socio sociological and political point of view to be addressed. The other is um, uh, that solutions are not necessarily also as black and white as they may seem. In other words, the important thing is obviously to reconcile the, the, the most important needs and interests of both sides in the conflict. Um, and this is not uh, necessarily mutually exclusive. So there are many ways of first identifying what those basic needs are, um, and then finding a solution either within the framework of the existing state or outside of it. And neither of them needs to harm one side or the other. In other words, there isn't really just a question of losing something. It is quite possible that a solution where that substate separates is actually going to benefit 
uh, if a good relationship is built between those two parts in a future uh, solution. So um, it, it is that kind of uh, instinctive reaction that everything is going to be lost if we give into this desire for separation um, that makes more sophisticated and more substantive discussions between the two sides possible. Um, and, and so as, uh, as, as uh, Alain also very well pointed out, I think, um, these, these are issues about balancing, not just balancing interests, as, as I've pointed out, but also balancing principles um, of, um, of democracy, of constitutionalism, um, and other territorial integrity is one of them. It is a package of things that needs to be discussed and untangled before you can find a solution. And I would think that with, um, uh, with the existence of the European Union um, and the degree to which sovereignty, however it is defined, um, has been delegated in one direction or the other direction to, this, to, to the European Union, uh, to regions, Etc. that it would seem so much easier to find a solution within that context. Um, since we're within the European Union, we're not really separate individual, completely sovereign entities anyway, um, than uh, in, in the, um, uh, I think as Sergius has, has characterized it in the uh, isolationist type of, of model which we encounter in many other parts of the world. Yeah, we definitely cannot hear the chairman and I have the impression that he's saying something behind oh. the mask actually. <laughs> yeah, I, I am speaking, yeah? but can, can you hear me? No. Only now, yes. now, before we, we okay, haven't okay, been able so to hear you for a good okay, okay. 10 minutes, I think. <laughs> okay, sorry. Sorry for that, because it's, sometimes it's, uh, with the mask, it's difficult to see if the person is speaking or not. I know. Eh, bien, estaba eh, intentando unir el, la última intervención eh, de Michael con la pregunta que se había formulado efectivamente eh, y que tiene que ver con la, con la primera cuestión que yo lanzaba sobre el reconocimiento y, y que tiene que ver también con el el argumento que estaba utilizando ahora Michael sobre eh, soluciones blancas o negras, soluciones muy dicotómicas, y en ese sentido eh, quería rescatar un concepto que ha introducido Alain en su intervención, eh, si no me equivoco, y que es el concepto de la asimetría, de la búsqueda de la asimetría o de la gestión de la asimetría. La gestión de la asimetría no parece tampoco mucho más fácil que la gestión del, de la soberanía eh, como tal. Eh, tenemos algunos ejemplos eh, también que se van repitiendo con el tiempo y seguramente Alain Gañón nos puede decir algo. Viene a mi, a mi memoria el, el referéndum fallido sobre los acuerdos de Charlotte Town en, en, en Canadá, en el, en el cual prácticamente la, las dos mayorías en juego, la de Quebec y la del resto de Canadá, rechazan un equilibrio que llega a buscarse eh, buscando precisamente una solución un poco más gris, no tan blanca o negra. Eh, ¿Cómo podemos articular, cómo nos podemos acercar desde la elaboración de un código como el que aspiramos a, a, a finalizar eh, a esas soluciones asimétricas en estados o en estados multinacionales o en estados que realmente tienen una sociología muy asimétrica? Quizás al engaño. Ok, uh, ok. Uh, gracias, uh, Eduardo, por su, uh, por su pregunta. Uh, yo voy a responder en in, in, in inglés. <laughs> uh, As you prefer. Well, first, first uh, let me indicate that to the question I was asked uh, earlier from uh, uh, one of the person who did not identify him or herself uh, before going into the asymmetry. I think that the question, who is the people, uh, is a good question, but at the same time, it's often used as a deflection, as a way by which you discredit uh, other uh, community for uh, their own societal or political project. 
So, uh, so I'm not sure if the, the question itself may, may raise a lot of, of problem. And when Michael uh, brought uh, on board the idea of multi-level governance, so to speak, uh, I think this gives us more leeway in terms of trying to find ways by which uh, either the Basque people or Catalonia or Galicia or other community can have access to some additional power uh, through, uh, either through Europe, instead of simply moving power from the state to, this, to Europe, I think the power perhaps can go, the, can go downward. And the idea that was raised earlier this morning uh, which I liked a lot on this uh, subsidiarity is just because I, I was born Catholic. I don't know why subsidiarity in Quebec has some resonance, but definitely the, the extent to which you can allow and, 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 and pass on power to the lower level of government possible, I think this is something that needs to be given some, some credit. With respect to asymmetry, uh, in Canada, like in, in Spain, uh, it looks like uh, the, the term has, has been viewed as uh, expression of privileges instead of the possibility for community to be able to act at different level, uh, at, the, at a different level of the territory because you could have the same exact same power, so to speak, instead of using the central state or the, or the the member state, you simply use the member state and act uh, fully within a set of uh, area of domain of responsibility. So, so the asymmetry for me is probably one of the most important one because it allows the community to express themselves much more immediately and force the spokesperson to be accountable directly to the community. But again, looking at, at Spain and some of the polls that we've seen, it looks like asymmetry is not to be toler tolerated uh, and it's viewed as, as I said, privileges. Uh, and, and I think they are wrong in assuming that. Can I, uh, uh, no, I see that Eduardo is speaking, but I can't hear him. Michael, go ahead. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, uh, just to, to clarify, um, the point I made about it uh, within Europe, but also outside, but within Europe, certainly, um, this possibility of, of less of a white, black and white uh, solution, as opposed to, uh, uh, in addition to the way in which we frame it, but also a solution, does not only work in the direction of conceiving of solutions um, of, um, moving sovereign power uh, or parts of it from the state downwards to the substate within that framework, but also uh, outside of it. In other words, there is, especially in the European situation, there are many solutions conceivable where, uh, for example, uh, Catalonia or the Basque country could uh, become sovereign independent states within the European Union, same with Scotland, um, but because we are all in the same union, um, the separation is, is not a very strong separation. It, mm -hmm. Since there are so many powers that, that are already delegated to the European Union, in effect, um, it, it, is, uh, it, it is simply um, a step in a gray area of various possible degrees of sharing of sovereignty within the European Union. And whether one really talks about two separate states within the European Union or not, it becomes less relevant and less important than it might have been if there was not the European Union. And the more the European Union integrates, the less uh, crucial it becomes um, to, uh, to define oneself as being uh, a separate state or not. And this, this should facilitate a feeling both among the non-Catalan uh, region people within Spain to say, well, it's not going to be a matter of life and death, um, uh, as, as also for, for the people within that region. Um, so I, I think it, it is that as well. And 
again, in reference to this anonymous question, which I do think is a very important question about who the people is, um, nobody takes away by granting self-determination or by allowing the exercise of self-determination by a people within a state, by a, a defined sub-state population, one does not take away the right of the rest of the population of that state of determining its own destiny. In other words, it isn't as if you allow the sub-state people the right to decide their destiny, and you, by doing that, you take it away from the others. Yes, there is a need for a compromise of some sort, but the rest of the people can continue to or can can define their own destiny, can determine whether they want to be united or not among themselves, can determine their social and political future, etc. cetera. Um, this is not the way that it is often seen. And the question reflects that. It is as if you're taking away their right to decide. You're taking away their right to decide the future of the other, but not uh, taking away the right of themselves to decide their own future. Um, so this, this, this was just a point I wanted to try to make. Jorge, I cannot... en el, yeah. en el, sorry. antes de darle la palabra a Jorge, yeah. se ha formulado yeah. también otra pregunta. Ahora se hacía referencia al marco de la Unión Europea eh, como un marco facilitador. Eh, la pregunta precisamente refiere al miedo de la Unión Europea al efecto contagio o al efecto dominó que puede mm. tener el reconocimiento de este tipo de situaciones. Le doy la palabra a Jorge y después eh, Donatella creo que quiere intervenir también. Muchas, muchas, muchas gracias. Eh, bueno, sobre, la, sobre las soluciones de crisis me gustaría decir algo porque bueno, yo creo que entre nosotros podemos estar seguramente de acuerdo y puede haber un gran consenso sobre quizás la idoneidad de soluciones que no sean blanco y negro, es decir, blanco y negro sería pues, el statu quo, la inmovilidad, el, el inmovilismo y por otro lado sería la, la independencia o la secesión. Pero yo creo que aquí, aquí realmente es importante tener en cuenta lo que, lo que, lo que dijo antes Salán, creo, sobre la, la, la importancia de entender estos conflictos territoriales de soberanía como una cuestión de legitimidad, legitimidad. En el, sentido, en el sentido muy simple de que eh, sí es cierto que hay que reconocer la legitimidad democrática de las demandas secesionistas en contextos democráticos como el escocés, el catalán, el vasco y en otros lugares, creo que también es importante entender la legitimidad de la posición de la mayoría nacional en el Estado en el que surge esa reivindicación soberanista o de secesión. En el sentido siguiente, de que, y es que eh, creo que tenemos que entender que eh, la mayoría nacional en el Estado, eh, o el Estado, digamos, por, por, decirlo, por decirlo brevemente, no tiene necesariamente por qué eh, apreciar una solución intermedia que implique quizás un acuerdo complejo, con asimetrías, con, con, con acuerdos federativos, eh, que lleve finalmente a una solución que evite la, la secesión o la independencia de la de la parte que, territorial que reivindica esa, esa opción. Eh, y por otro lado, tenemos que, ver también, tenemos que ver también que en este tipo de conflictos lo que se ha podido observar es que eh, es algo, es, es, es decir, estas soluciones de grises, es algo que eh, encontramos con bastante normalidad eh, como reivindicación por parte de las minorías territoriales, es decir, por parte de las minorías nacionales que llegan a reivindicar una solución secesionista, antes de llegar a este paso, antes de llegar a esta etapa, a esta solución última, eh, hemos podido observar cómo en Quebec, como en Escocia, como en, en Cataluña, por ejemplo, se han pedido reformas del sistema eh, que no implicaban una, una ruptura con, con el sistema. Yo creo que esto es algo, algo que es muy importante, es muy importante tener... Eh, tener en cuenta, considerando también, insisto en esto, considerando también que, que creo que tenemos que entender, creo que tenemos que hacer un esfuerzo por entender que la mayoría nacional en el Estado o el Estado eh, no tiene por qué apreciar este tipo de reformas. Pero en ese caso, diría, en ese caso es cuando necesariamente vuelva a cobrar legitimidad la opción 
que nos puede, digamos, gustar menos, nos puede parecer menos atractiva intelectualmente o políticamente, pero no, en, entra en juego con más fuerza, si cabe, la opción de, lo, digamos, de blanco y negro, de statu quo o preferiblemente eh, la, salida democrática, eh, la salida democrática al problema. Una muy breve, una muy breve consideración también sobre eh, dos preguntas que se han hecho. La, la primera sobre, sobre el sujeto del derecho de autodeterminación. Yo creo que hay que entender, eso es algo muy importante, yo creo que hay que entender, es algo que se ha explicado mucho en la literatura especializada, creo que hay que entender que en un contexto, por ejemplo, como el español y el catalán, si consideramos que el derecho de autodeterminación de los catalanes tiene que eh, significar un referéndum de autodeterminación de todo el pueblo español, esto es una perversión total del eh, principio de la autodeterminación, ya que el principio de la autodeterminación está pensado para que se expresen y decidan los pueblos que reivindican ese derecho a la autodeterminación. El pueblo español tenemos que entender que ya está autodeterminado, ya tiene su propio estado. Por consiguiente, no tiene mucho sentido, no tiene mucho sentido creo que eh, en un conflicto como este se planteemos eh, la, la cuestión de esa, de esa manera, eh, generando dudas sobre el sujeto, el sujeto de ese eventual derecho a la autodeterminación, que a mi entender, y creo que somos bastantes los que pensamos así, a mi entender el sujeto político está bastante claro, está identificado y es bastante... Claro. Y sobre la cuestión, muy brevemente también, porque me gustaría dar la palabra a Donatella, que, que se exprese también, eh, eh, sobre la cuestión del efecto contagio en la Unión Europea, yo creo que esto es, esto es poco realista, a mi entender, es poco realista porque a día de hoy, a día de hoy, cuando observamos el panorama europeo, mirando los movimientos secesionistas existentes en los diferentes Estados miembros de la Unión Europea, Podemos observar ciertamente que hay movimientos nacionalistas o regionalistas, pero hay muy pocos movimientos secesionistas propiamente, propiamente hablando. Por lo tanto, creo que este efecto contagio eh, es, es poco realista a corto plazo, lo cual no significa, lo cual no significa y, termino, y termino aquí, lo cual no significa que el propio proceso de federalización de la Unión Europea, pero esto ya no tiene nada que ver con los movimientos secesionistas, lo cual no significa que el propio eh, proceso de federalización de la Unión Europea, si sigue su camino y se acaba, digamos, llegando a una mayor integración política y social, no genere por sí mismo un movimiento, eh, en este caso sí, de, digamos, de acceso a la condición de estatalidad para convertirse en un actor político que esté en la mesa de discusiones a nivel, a nivel europeo, lo que no es el caso actualmente eh, para regiones poderosas como Baviera, o como, o como Cataluña, o, 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 como, o como Escocia. Sí, yes. uh, I agree with the, with the last point. I also uh, do not see uh, many actual um, problems of uh, uh, exploding conflicts in the European Union, especially once the uh, UK are, uh, have completed the Brexit. Because I see that uh, uh, other uh, uh, possible conflicts that could be relevant are uh, in the Northern Ireland, but uh, they, they will no longer be within Europe. Uh, int intended, uh, understood as the European Union. I also saw that there was a question that was addressed more directly to me about the role of uh, new parties, uh, movement parties emerging and what it could mean in terms of uh, uh, conflicts on sovereignty. And I just wanted to go back to a couple of points that uh, I made all, uh, also in the general presentations. One is that from the sociological perspective, um, conflicts tend to be quite messy in the sense that uh, they tend to see overlapping cleavages. Uh, and uh, in conflicts of sovereignty, there are al also many other uh, issues or cleavages that uh, interact. So issues of social justice, uh, issues of democracy uh, are all issues that are mobilized 
uh, within uh, uh, conflicts on uh, sovereignty. And in fact, what we saw in the recent wave uh, of uh, uh, conflicts is that they have emerged uh, within uh, a series of uh, crises, uh, like the uh, austerity crisis that clearly played a role uh, in the Catalan case, but also uh, in the Scottish case. And so that um, the role that these parties could have uh, is in uh, uh, addressing um, cleavages that are of, uh, often related with uh, uh, what Rockham uh, defined as the center periphery. So in moments of heightened conflicts, in moments of global wave of protest, like the one that we were living before the pandemics, but uh, is uh, uh, still um, quite uh, uh, active at the moment, what we see is the need to address uh, several uh, problems and uh, that territorial pro uh, conflicts in general uh, are uh, um, uh, opening up. So, but they are not only center periphery uh, conflicts in uh, Stein Rockan definitions, but also, for instance, the urban rural type of territorial conflicts that we say uh, that we see playing an important role, uh, for instance, in uh, the American election. So territory is important, but I think it's um, uh, territorial identities are also uh, referred to imagined communities. And so I think that uh, uh, changes in the party system and the emergence of movements that address also issues of uh, class and democracy uh, are to be taken into account. Another issue which I think is also relevant is that, um, as we know, conflicts tend to evolve in different uh, uh, directions according uh, to the ways in which uh, several and complex players uh, 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 play a role within uh, this uh, evolution. And in this sense, I think it is important also to consider the role that uh, these movements and parties can have uh, in uh, creating spaces uh, for uh, um, what is usually understood as participatory forms of democracy or deliberative forms of democracy, so spaces in which uh, um, the different positions can be uh, um, put in, in dialogue with each other. It was mentioned just before in the debate, uh, uh, the solutions is often not uh, um, black and white, not uh, a choice between the black and the white, but it requires also the development of innovative visions that could be in fact produced uh, by uh, new actors in the political parties. For sure, repressions uh, always brings about uh, radicalizations of uh, forms of actions, but also radicalizations of goals so that it could bring about uh, more uh, nefarious forms of uh, 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 nationalism, while inclusive forms of nationalism uh, could go together with uh, reflections on um, uh, social justice and democracy. Uh, in this, I think uh, we have been focusing a lot on referendums as a potential uh, solutions, but, uh, and I think uh, that uh, this uh, is um, a main uh, uh, way of addressing democratically uh, sort of um, uh, territorial conflicts as other conflicts, but also referendums are expressions of direct democracy that could also always be risky because uh, not only they imply the need uh, to make decisions about who has the right to participate uh, in the uh, decision making forms, but also tend to polarize, tend to create the black and white. Uh, visions. So referendums are needed, but I, I think they also need to be accompanied by uh, um, different uh, forms and institutions of democracy, uh, uh, deliberative arenas uh, and uh, uh, participatory type of uh, arenas in which people not only vote, but they can talk. Often this is a part of the referendums process, so also to create debate 
it's, uh, we have seen it in Scotland, we have seen it also in uh, uh, Catalonia, but I think this also needs to be taken into account. So it is uh, uh, not only with the referendum, but uh, with intervening uh, uh, or thinking about what can make the referendum more high quality. I may join, jump in and ask uh, Donatella, please, could you tell us what you mean by uh, radical radicalism? Uh, if you were to look at the case of Spain, for instance, uh, who are the radicals? Well, I was thinking not, not uh, uh, immediately to the Spanish situations, but more in general uh, uh, about the development of um, uh, uh, cycle of uh, protest. But uh, Spain has also a history of uh, uh, violence related with ethnic conflicts. That is more a uh, history of the past. What we have studied uh, in, with reference to the more recent wave uh, of territorial conflicts in Catalonia is that there has been um, not much instance of uh, radicalizations in the forms of, of actions. So the, there was uh, uh, no clandestine political organizations and there was also very little violence in the street. But we have seen uh, that the uh, type of aims, uh, uh, both at the collective level by uh, the uh, political parties that refer to uh, Catalanism and by the individuals have moved from a uh, request of uh, uh, increasing autonomy into request of uh, independence. So this uh, is also a form of uh, um, escalations that uh, repression brings about and that the lack of channels uh, uh, for uh, uh, discussing uh, uh, possible solutions bring, brings about. So the study that we have done uh, uh, of the evolutions of um, uh, the uh, recent years shows that uh, uh, in uh, Catalonia it uh, all started with uh, uh, frustrations uh, of a um, process that could have uh, uh, brought about uh, uh, more um, uh, autonomy and more political uh, autonomy without uh, um, escalating into request of independence. It was not the requests that were dominating in the in the beginning, uh, and uh, um, at this point also what we see is not uh, uh, an escalations of uh, uh, the. Um, say, uh, violence in the streets, but for sure there's been uh, a, an institutional escalation of the uh, conflicts. The attempt to um, centralize the, have produced a backlash. And so this, this is what uh, uh, I mean in general. And of course, I've studied also uh, civil wars, and we have examples of uh, referendums that ended up uh, in higher polarizations because uh, 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 referendums can scare the minorities, uh, whichever these uh, are. And this is why I think that two forms of direct democracy, one needs to also, um, say, uh, put together, uh, combined with uh, uh, forms of uh, participation and deliberation. wanted to say that there's five minutes left, but it's, we're running out of time. We have been already here for one hour. Um, there is a still, uh, there are still two additional questions, one referring to feelings against rights, and another one is, I guess, most, more a comment to respond to, to Jorge. But as we don't have uh, more time to, to, to debate, I would invite you to, to make probably a final remark if you want to address one of these two topics. But if not, please, uh, a final uh, short uh, remark to conclude all this, uh, this, this panel and this debate. Who wants to start? Maybe Sergius? Yes, well, no, no. Oh, sorry. Uh, Michael, I think you asked the floor, so sorry. Yeah, you, you. It doesn't matter. It doesn't okay. matter. Um, I just think, as a final remark, I uh, very much think it is useful to um, focus 
uh, our attention on the issue of legitimacy, which has been brought up by a number of speakers uh, uh, as, as a kind of anchor of a lot of this, this discussion. Also in relation to, to the last question you posed about the domino effect, um, there is nothing inherently positive or negative about separation, about having more, a, a larger number of states or, or a smaller number of states. There is no inherent, inherent uh, size of territory that works better than another. And we have lots of examples of that in Europe uh, and outside. So the, the core question becomes what, um, what type of policy and um, relationships between policies creates the, the highest degree of legitimacy. Um, and that can be, and that can uh, require separation, can require a solution uh, of separation if uh, a particular constituent part of a state no longer feels represented by the state, no longer feels it belongs in it and that that state represents its needs and interests. Um, because that is a deficit in legitimacy of that state. Um, and for the European Union as a union, the legitimacy of the union also increases as the people that constitute the union uh, feel most uh, participat participating in the union and feel that they are fully represented and that their needs are fully represented by it. Um, so at, at the different levels, at the supra level, at the, at the national level, um, or the state level, and the sub-state level, questions of legitimacy, including uh, the discussion on rights of minorities, um, I think is, is the key concept that, that um, we constantly need to focus back on in terms of responding to these, these various questions. Thank you. Maybe now, yes, Sergius. I uh, didn't approach the minority issue yet, but maybe you can say something in your final remark. Well, <laughs> what can I say? What can I say besides the the obvious? Um, it was indeed not really touched in the in the debate, but I think it's strongly linked to to what Donatella was saying in her most recent intervention. So, um, in that sense, I think it's it's crucial here um, in terms of. The conceptual effort, so minority issues needs to be respected. But as I said in my presentation, this is not only important if we look at the grievances of uh, Catalans, Scots, and so on. It's also about the the solution that that can be should be implemented with actually independence happens. And here in this context, perhaps, and this is something I did not mention in the in my presentation. It's in the text. Um, but it is linked to, to I think many points made by the by the by the colleagues uh, on the on the panel that actually the serious look at minority rights can also lessen the tension between the successor state and the newly independent state. You know, because if we ask the question, okay, so what would be the position of people siding with Spain independent, in independent Catalonia? What will be the position of people siding, if I can use it, this, this sort of colloquial word, um, siding with England or United Kingdom, the continuity of the United Kingdom in the independence of Scotland? This actually, this conceptual process can actually bring those two new entities together. So the successor state and the newly independent states, and also, just bring down the, the, the tension, because I think we very frequently assume that what will happen after independence, it will be a prolonged period of actually uh, very rough discussions concerning, you know, how things have to be divided, you know, what will be the future relation of both sides and so on. So I think minority rights in this sense can be also an issue. Of course, it cuts across to the deliberative aspect mentioned by Donatel and so on. So the, the need to listen to everyone literally during the uh, independence referendum campaigns and, and so on. But I think really we should not miss this point. And then just a final point uh, concerning the, the European Union, uh, because instinctively I very much tend to sympathize with those views that actually the due to the complexity of the European Union, perhaps there is space for very asymmetrical solutions, perhaps solutions that that you know are 
kind of unimaginable from unimaginable from the from the from the pe present point of view but at the same time if i look at the, at the the way the union the european union is constructed and for example at the european council the ultimate body responsible for the direction of the union at the tables who sits at the tables these are at the table these are the states and I think this is also one of the reasons why the, the, the conflicts of, of sovereignty will not disappear because still this issue, you know, concerning the chair at the table where the states are deciding upon the general direction of something as large as the European Union, this is the ultimate goal. And so, so I think that perhaps this dissolution of, of the context of sovereignty within the wider concept of the U European Union is not really possible. I mean, of course, the newly created states, they would like to join, and this is beyond doubt, you know, but they, they really want to sit at the very, very table where the ultimate decisions are made. So I think we cannot forget about, about this aspect. Sorry for taking so much time. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, well, I think based on what we've just said this morning, uh, we probably need a change of perspective. Uh, there is a view uh, that too many people advance is that nothing, in fact, everything is settled for forever. Uh, but my view is that nothing is settled forever. And uh, the view that is very present in, in some European countries uh, that that Constitutional fundamentalism needs to be protected by all means. I think this is something that ought to be questioned very, very much. And otherwise, we go, we're going to all go to the wall. I mean, uh, there's a wall in front of us, and it's not very, very securing. So uh, we need to change our attitude with respect to that. Nothing is settled once and for all. I will, I will simply uh, conclude on that. Yes, I think it's my turn. Uh, and uh, I, I, I think that it is very important to think about the legal frames, but my, uh, I agree very much also on uh, the need to reflect on a process that could open pathways for uh, different solutions, tailored solutions, things that, uh, as my colleague before was saying, uh, uh, we cannot imagine yet, because uh, um, I, um, often the way in which territorial politics is conceived is in terms of uh, territorial actors. But what we know is uh, uh, that actors within each territory are very divided. And so uh, we need uh, also democratic um, uh, legitimacy, reflections on legitimacy, but also reflections on democracy uh, in order to create space within the different uh, type of territorial uh, uh, units. So often we think in terms of uh, um, spaces in which representatives of uh, the periphery and representative of the center are present. But uh, we have conflicts within the periphery and we have conflicts within the center. So not only we have different cleavages interacting, uh, but we have also the need to think about uh, democratic options, uh, uh, democratic channels, democratic institutions that can uh, um, help broadening the, the uh, type, not only the number of actors, but also the type of actors that could sit uh, at the table. And this is why I also think these initiatives is very important to reflect upon all these issues. Thank you. Brasi, Jorge, por favor. No, solo una frase, decir que decir únicamente que, bueno, yo creo, yo creo que realmente eh, el, debate, el debate es sobre la extensión del derecho a la autodeterminación y yo creo que esto es, esto es muy importante, muy importante que reflexionemos todos colectivamente sobre las maneras como este, este derecho a la autodeterminación puede extenderse más allá de los casos ya consagrados, las colonias, los territorios que bueno, sufren digamos, la dominación de otro pueblo, de otro estado. Yo creo que ese es el debate a día de hoy. No podemos retroceder en ese debate a cuestiones que están pues, ya muy consolidadas, como la cuestión, como comenté anteriormente en respuesta a la, a la pregunta, 
la cuestión del sujeto, de ese, derecho, de ese derecho a la autodeterminación. El derecho a la autodeterminación es un derecho democrático y es quizás el primero de los derechos democráticos. ¿no? Es el primer derecho que da lugar a, a todos los otros derechos democráticos y creo que por, eso, por esa razón es, es necesario que todos tratemos de reflexionar y de pensar en él de manera que pueda extenderse al mayor número de, de, de individuos y de ciudadanos en, en, en nuestro mundo. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much to all of you for your contribution and apologize for the technical issues we may have had uh, during the panel. But uh, we look forward to keeping in touch for, for moving forward with this project uh, about uh, this code of good practices. Thank you very much. Uh, and now I give the floor back to Thank you. Beatriz. Uh, Gracias. Natela, Michael, Alain, Sergius, Jorge, thank you very much for offering uh, us such a rich debate. And until tomorrow, because tomorrow we have a great, great meet too. Es que ricasco gusti hoy. Marato y Isandugu, venía usted, te duki, sornitu garela. Eta badakagu zertaz e, e, ausnartu. Biar jarraitzen dugu eta biar egun handia dakagu. Labur labur, e, una luze junda, aberatza, e, islari, islarien, islarien ekarpena jaso ditugu, islari guztien ekarpena jaso ditugu, oso lazare, oso, oso trinkoa izan da eta emankorra. E, baina, honekin ez da amaitzen, honekin ez dira jarrunaldiak amaitzen. Esan genuen hasieran, e, jarrunaldi hauek bereziak ziala. Zala, ez zirela jarrunaldi akademiko arruntak. No eran unas jornadas académicas al uso y no se refiere solo a las circunstancias excepcionales de tener que hacerlo todo online. El, no son unas jornadas al uso porque, por un lado, son un hito en un recorrido más largo. Llevamos año y medio trabajando en esta cuestión y nuestro objetivo es llegar a Europa con todas estas reflexiones, las de hoy y la que, las que están acumuladas y vertidas en la segunda característica eh, digamos, especial de estas jornadas, que venimos a presentar un producto. Un producto que se ha ido elaborando a lo largo del último año y medio con muchos de los representantes y de los expertos y expertas que están aquí entre nosotros hoy, que han estado ahí entre nosotros y nosotras. Por tanto, el día importante, digamos, de las jornadas, no, no porque no sea importante el de hoy el debate y no porque no sea importante el de ayer, el día uh, clave de las jornadas es el día de mañana. Mañana presentaremos el código de buenas prácticas, las bases para un código de buenas prácticas para la resolución de conflictos de soberanía en Europa. Haremos una explicación de cuáles son los contenidos esenciales de esas bases. Va a ser una primera versión que vamos a ir alimentando y mejorando, en primer lugar, con muchas de las ideas que han aparecido hoy en los debates y también el día de ayer. Y, evidentemente, el, el objetivo de todo esto es que ese código en algún momento llegue a uh, estar en Europa y llegue a ser asumido normativamente por las instituciones europeas. Y hasta que lleguemos hasta ese momento, seguiremos trabajando al menos en el partenariado académico y también el partenariado que vamos a visualizar mañana, eh, porque van a estar presentes con nosotros las fundaciones que han apoyado eh, este proyecto. Será a las once y media, a las once y media haremos la presentación eh, del código y estarán con nosotros y nosotras no solo el equipo redactor o gran parte del equipo redactor del, de la propuesta de código, sino también eh, Lisenda Casañas Adams, Nikos Escutaris, Constanza Mayota, Sergius Boder, Marc Ortrup, Francesco Palermo, Nicola McEwen, Timothy Waters, Mike Malbalt y Alan Gañón. Eh, todos estos expertos y expertas van a acompañarnos en la presentación del, del código mañana y todos ellos comparten una idea. Quizá no compartan los contenidos concretos de ese código, que son al fin y al cabo 30 páginas en las que estamos haciendo una propuesta muy amplia y prolija. Lo que sí comparten es que la solución de los conflictos de soberanía en Europa debe ser una solución democrática y por eso van a estar con nosotros mañana. Algunos de los que están ahí y algunos de los que nos han dicho que van a estar mañana por la mañana a las once y media presentando el proyecto van a tener que levantarse a las cinco de la mañana. Así que creo que a nosotros nos va a costar bastante menos estar a las once y media y aunque solo sea por eso, yo creo que tenemos que estar todos aquí conectados o físicamente para escuchar eh, esa presentación del código. Así que, sin más, voy a darte las cargas con usted.